everyone who's joining us here. Uh, joining us here. Uh, joining us here. Uh, joining us here. Uh, oh, I get again some echo there. I get some echo there. And I'm not sure where that echo is coming from. Who's joining us? I'm going to be having the conversation with Frank. You are welcome to ask questions in the chat at any time. So you're out, you're welcome to ask questions in uh, the Zoom chat here, and we'll be reading those as we go. Uh, we'll have a couple of pauses where we'll we'll jump into those questions. If you are following us on YouTube or if you are in LinkedIn, you're very welcome to leave comments in uh, the comment section on the stream, and uh, those will be piped in to us. So. Uh, I'd love to jump right into it. Um, Frank, uh, good morning. Really happy to have you with us. I just wanted to give a quick introduction to Frank for people who don't know him. Dr. Frank Sauer is a senior research fellow at the Universität der Bundeswehr München. He's also the head of research for the Medis Institute for Strategy and Foresight. Frank is the author of Atomic Anxiety, Deterrence, Taboo, and the Non-Use of, uh, non of U.S. Nuclear Weapons. He's also the co-editor of the Handbook of International Relations. Uh, Frank regularly researches and publishes international security topics. Uh, his special focuses are nuclear weapons, terrorism, cybersecurity, and the use of robotics and artificial intelligence in the military. Uh, he is a, a highly regarded and rewarded researcher and speaker. He regularly speaks to the public via interviews like this week on Tagesthemen. And uh, he writes opinion pieces. He briefs members of the German Bundestag in expert hearings. And he also speaks to the international community at the United Nations in Geneva. Frank is a member of the International Committee for the Robotic Arms Control, uh, International Committee for Robotic Arms Control, ICRAC, and is also part of the management team of the International Panel on the Regulation of Autonomous Weapons. Frank, thank you for joining us. We are so happy to have you with us this morning. Himo. Thanks so much for having me. It's it's a great pleasure. It's always great to be with Ada. Um, and I will jump right in um, and preface this by saying one thing. This conversation, I'm well aware, is supposed to be about the information and technology side of, of the Russian war against Ukraine. But I would preface this by saying that at, what we're seeing, at least so far, is very much a 20th century and not a 21st century conflict. Um, I'd like to cite Chaos Computer Club's Manuel Atuk, who put it a couple of days ago quite well, I think he said, you can't cyber away an AK. And that is it. We're seeing tanks, we're seeing armored personnel carriers, we're seeing AK-47s. That said, I have three observations uh, regarding the role of information and technology that I'd like to share with you uh, in the form of three very pointed theses, hoping to stimulate conversation. So thesis one, and I blatantly stole this from someone else's Twitter, but it's just too good not to use. Thesis one, the old KGB professional Putin has lost the info war against the comedian with the smartphone Zelensky. Thesis two, cyber war is once again not happening. Thesis three, if by now you're not convinced that big tech is a geopolitical player as well, you're not paying attention. Okay, now first about the information war that Putin by all accounts is losing or has lost already. I'd like to say first that we should not kid ourselves and think that we're seeing the whole picture here. Clearly, we do not and we should be very cautious with regard to what we're seeing, uh, what we're hearing and especially be double cautious, cautious with, with uh, what we are sharing online. Um, also, Russia, in my mind, lost the information war not because the rest of the world or us, if there is such a thing, was better prepared or more resilient, but mainly due to Putin's own mistakes. The key here uh, is, I think, a stark asymmetry of information dissemination. Putin tried to isolate what is happening in Ukraine to keep it from the Russian public or to be in a position to shape the narrative towards his domestic audience. 
that's one of the reasons uh, for why the Russian soldiers actually had to give up their smartphones before the invasion, where, of course, we are seeing this on a daily basis, the Ukrainian armed forces, and of course, the civilian population in, in Ukraine is using them all the time. Um, an interesting um, side note here and a shout out to Paul Strobel, who did a, did a uh, very good for German readers, good thread on Twitter on the uh, Kadyrov, uh, the Chechens uh, entering the war. They ran like their own little propaganda campaign online. And that is basically what we expected to see on a much larger scale, but we didn't. <clears throat> Putin, in other words, ceded the information environment to Ukraine. And more than that, um, a thing that basically we all expected that would take place, namely Putin opening the so-called uh, fire hose of falsehoods, a thing, a, a term that has been coined mainly around the shoot down of uh, Malaysian Airlines flight, flight 17. Um, and the idea being uh, that the creation of an avalanche of disinformation uh, serves to not necessarily establish a counter narrative, but to simply bury the truth under a pile of fake news. That didn't really happen. Uh, it had some effect, of course, from at least what I can tell on the Russian population and the domestic audience, but internationally, that uh, had remarkably little effect uh, to the extent that it happened at all. Potentially, and that is purely speculation because the usual suspects involved in these kinds of things, like the Internet Research Agency, like troll farms that we've all you know, heard about in over the last couple of years, might have been directly targeted beforehand. I'm not sure about, about that. That is, as I said, speculation. One final observation regarding this, this first point. Um, these attempts in the very beginning uh, regarding false flag operations, um, I don't know. There were, there were a couple of things, um, like um, supposedly an attack on a, on a Ukrainian border post, an attack on a pipeline, um, uh, attacks on chlorine gas um, uh, tanks, stuff like this. All of this was remarkably poorly executed from uh, on the Russian side and quickly debunked by Bellingcat and all the other open source intelligence professionals online. And again, I would say it appears that these things were put together mainly with the domestic audience um, in mind. They were not you know, sophisticated enough to really make a big dent uh, with regard to the rest of the world watching what is happening. And so if you look at the big narrative, the, the globally speaking, all indicators point to Russia having badly miscalculated and being defeated in the information warfare space. And you all know what that entails by now. It means sanctions, companies withdrawing, assets of oligarchs being seized, sports events canceled, Russian and Belarusian athletes excluded, and so on, and so on, and so forth. I mean, even the Taliban came out <laughs> and urged Putin to restrain himself. And uh, while the UN resolution after the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula had about 100 countries or so condemning Russia's actions in 2014, this time, two days ago, Putin was left with Belarus, Eritrea, Syria, and North Korea as his only remaining friends. And I think this pretty much shows how our public opinion is clearly on one side here. Okay, that's um, my remarks about the information war. Now on to number two, the cyber war that we all expected, which um, is you know, nowhere to be seen or barely visible. Um, again, a side note here, like so many other things uh, on the high tech side of, of things, such as a whole list of modern weapon systems that experts like myself um, had you know, been uh, lo looking out for or keeping an eye on from the, from the get go, few of these things, if any, are present. Um, Clearly, of course, uh, with regard to the cyber uh, domain, some Ukrainian government websites were taken down. Um, but a couple of things that could have reasonably been expected did not take place. Ukraine, Ukrainian internet was not taken down. The cell phone networks were not taken down. The energy grid was not targeted, something for which Russia had made Ukraine basically a test bed in the past. And um, another thing, uh, that made the rounds recently is that supposedly German windmills were targeted, uh, putting renewable energy production in, in jeopardy. This, at least from I, what I can tell, um, did not happen. It, it did not happen in a targeted specific way. It's just that a satellite network outage um, actually did take place at the uh, outset of the invasion. And the, the windmills going offline is basically just a collateral from that. 
What we have seen is Isaac Wiper and Hermetic uh, Wizard, two malwares destroying data. Those were planted weeks and months before. We knew about those um, more or less. Um, and they were triggered at the time of the in invasion. So there, there you have basically a, a, quite a classical cyber uh, means that in fact uh, we have observed, but the effect, at least to my knowledge, remained quite limited. An interesting um, note in, in this regard is that Anonymous um, has been in the mix for a couple of days now, taking down, for instance, Russian infrastructure. And I, in my mind, that's a problem. Um, attribution always is a problem in computer network operations. Um, and the third party now joining only increases the risk of retribution misfiring and things escalating even more. That's it for the, for the cyber side of things. Last but not least, a few remarks on the role of big tech. Um, and I'm sure you've read ton of, tons of examples over the last couple of days, and you will uh, you know, know most of them. I'll leave it at a few. So for instance, what, what, what was the involvement of big tech in Ukraine? Well, Google, for instance, turned off traffic data on Google Maps because tank columns showed up as traffic jams. You know, the Ukrainians, obviously, they all have their smartphones. The smartphones aren't moving. Boop, you get a traffic jam on, on Google Maps. And so the position of the Ukrainians are, is given away. Uh, and then that made a lot of headlines. Of course, Starlink um, is, in fact, providing satellite internet. I'd say beware. Those dishes show, they light up like a Christmas tree on Russian uh, signal intelligence. Um, and, you know, in Russia, on the other hand, Google and Apple both have deactivated their, their payment services. So no more Google Pay and no more Apple Pay in Russia. And Meta and uh, Meta Facebook was forced to limit bandwidth to uh, restrict the loading of, of images and video again to keep what is going on or at least what Ukraine is disseminating in the information space to reach uh, the Russian population. And there's even now a talk, uh, there's even now talk about a potential uh, block of YouTube in Russia. Um, in somewhat weirder news, I found that just too interesting not to mention. Uh, and then, in fact, Kimo and I talked about this a couple of days ago. Um, so Anonymous actually called upon people to leave Google Maps reviews for uh, Moscow restaurants and tell people, you know, via this side channel, what is actually going on in Ukraine. I read this morning that uh, Google is or is in the process or has pretty much taken down most of this. There's even a, a more interesting um, side, uh, side channel uh, attack happening, and that's called Tindering for World Peace. And uh, this is where people connect uh, Russians on, on Tinder <laughs> to fill them in what's currently going on. So in some, I'd say, you know, big tech has an enormous influence and big tech at this point uh, can throw around um, its weight in a way that has geopolitical uh, implications. Um, I'd say, obviously, I mean, this comes as no surprise to anyone on this call, I suppose. Uh, but the takeaway for us should be that we have to intensify, I think, our conversation about what we as a society are comfortable with delegating to these private companies and where we draw a line. And that's my remarks. Uh, thank you for your interest, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks, Frank. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. You, you hit a bunch of themes here that I want to dive in deeper. Um, and I want to jump right in with this relationship between information war and the overall war and, and also the role of tech companies. So I actually wanted to start with a comment from uh, Peter Singer, uh, who was writing yesterday. And something he said stood out to me. He said, if Ukraine had no messages of the righteousness of its cause, the popularity of its cause, the valor of its heroes, the suffering of its populace, then it would lose. Not just the information war, but it would lose the overall war. So two questions there. Do you agree with him? And um, considering you know, all of this, how much impact does it have on the overall war that social media companies have essentially picked aside here? Okay, that's, that's, that's a lot to unpack. So <clears throat> I'd say it has a huge influence on the, on the actual um, proceedings on the battlefield. Um, if you compare fighting morale uh, of the Ukrainian forces um, with that of the Russians, the contrast couldn't be more stark. It is literally the Russian um troops were lied to they were uh, in some ways 
apparently even forced to uh, take part in this campaign. Um, some of them, clearly, we know this now, did not even, they weren't even aware that they're fighting a war against Ukraine. They thought themselves being, you know, at maneuver in, in at a maneuver in Belarus. And now all of a sudden they find themselves in this shooting war <laughs> and some of them simply you know abandon their equipment and walk home they they don't have fuel they don't they have, they have nothing to eat some of them get lost they don't know where they are and basically there you know, there's a circle of ukrainians yelling at them to fuck off and um so in terms of morale i think the russians are close to close to zero if that's you know if, if i it's it's unclear to me how it could get any worse at this point on the other side, the Ukrainians are um, remarkable in many ways. Um, like, for instance, the bubble that I exist in, there's people who know, actually know things about how fighting works um, as, um, as a practice, um, who are in the military and who train for these things. And even uh, they are sometimes astonished by what the Ukrainians are doing, both the armed forces and then these territorial defense forces that they simply came up out of out of thin air, it seems, which is not true. Of course, you can Ukraine was preparing for this um, for quite a while. Um, and so the heavy losses that they're inflicting on the on the Russians uh, that I think also we can take for a given at this point, of course, numbers. Um, there are different numbers being kicked around. The Russians are saying like it's about 500. Uh, I've heard numbers now from six to eight thousands from Ukraine. Just to give you an idea, the USA lost 2,400 troops in combat in Afghanistan over 20 years. And we're now, what, day nine of the conflict. And Russia has already, you know, obliterated this, this number and basically is probably at twice that. And so has the information war, has Zelensky as a person with the messages that he's been sending and the way he has positioned himself as a leader, has that made an impact? I would say yes. It's obviously hard to put a number on this, but I think it, it's, it has a huge, huge influence on, on how the way things are currently going on the ground. And I think the second part of your question is, does it make a difference that social media companies have more or less taken a side in this? Yes, I mean, clearly we, we, we see what they can do if they flip the switch in Russia. People are now on a daily basis already um, at least at least inconvenienced by what, for instance, Google and Apple can do. I, you probably saw the, the long lines at the Russian, at the Moscow Metro, where people usually go you know, in with their Google or Apple smartphone and go boop, and pay their fare and now they're all you know scrunching for for cash and looking how to pay their metro fare because all these infrastructures have stopped working for them and only for them and so i think yes again hard to say probably um the dent that is making is smaller than the the whole Zelensky myth and the resistance you know legend that is being created by the by the ukrainians there will be, you know, dissertations written about this in the years to come. Obviously, you know, Zelensky was not necessarily a super popular president before this, but, you know, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on Ukraine. So I say this with, with all due caution, but currently he is he is doing everything right, I, th I think, from the way he is standing and where Ukraine is standing. And so, yes, these things matter immensely, I think. And I, and I wanted to, you know, maybe maybe dive a little bit deeper into that because because clearly, you know, there's a there's an impact on things like morale and performance from having the narrative kind of dominated. But um, I wanted to ask you kind of what your what your opinion was on on an argument by someone like Yuval Noah Harari, who, who mm -hmm. basically said Russia has already lost the war. It may go yeah. on for years. Russia may may militarily dominate, but they could be there for thirty years, and and already in one weekend. The Ukrainians have established themselves as a people with a history, as a unique people separate from Russia, and that's never going to go away. Yes, I tend to agree with this. I think it only, you know, Putin's cause for war is not NATO expansion to the east or something like that. It is that he denies that there exists such a thing as Ukraine, as a sovereign country, and a, a thing... Um, as the Ukrainian national identity. He 
you know, blatantly said, this is just a part of Russia, of greater Russia, and we're now taking this back. It belongs to us. It never belonged to anybody else. And this is this is my goal. And this still, I think, remains the goal of this war to basically make Ukraine as it exists today cease to exist. And if there was any, I again, not an expert on Ukraine, but I mean, it's a country and there's, uh, you know, um, debates and there's, um, you know, controversies and grievances and people are not, you know, necessarily all galvanized into one, you know, German nation, Ukrainian nation or, you know, a US nation. Now they are. That's what Putin did. He has basically made them all rally around the flag in a way that you would never, ever have been uh, able to do with any other means. And so in that sense, it's probably correct to expect uh, this war to be lost in a sense that even if he were, and that is to be expected, I still expect this to go in the long run, militarily speaking, on the ground, um, to go the way that um, eventually Kiev will fall, eventually the uh, Zelensky uh, administration will cease to exist. It's not what I, I liked, like to see, but there's little reason to believe that if this drags on long enough, the Russians will not by sheer numbers and sheer overwhelming force be able to decide this for them. Even then, <clears throat> um, it will never be like Belarus, for instance, where you know Russian influence can exist and is um, um, you know is is certain for the Kremlin. The uh, even with a, a puppet regime installed, the the Ukrainians will keep fighting, and so in that sense, I think yes, the war is lost, and the in in a sense that this goal that Putin set himself out to achieve this time, uh, he cannot achieve. So, so what what happened to Putin? I mean, over the last years, kind of the narrative has has been like this guy is a master of manipulation. Yeah. He's the one who pulls all the puppet strings on you know public perception. You know, he's he's like this masterful KGB player at playing the information sphere and dominating the conversation and muddying the truth. And then, boom! In one weekend, that all just falls apart. What what what's going on? Yeah, that's an excellent excellent question. Um, Shameless, uh, you know, uh, plug. Uh, I have a I have a little uh, podcast that I do with three colleagues of mine called Sicherheitshalber, and we have on a regular basis basically the, this conversation. We've had this in the past, wondering <clears throat> is Putin the four dimensional chess genius that people make him out to be? Because we have this weird thing in the West where we say, yeah, ha ha, you know, we messed it up again. And look who's laughing in the Kremlin, Putin again. He knew this, you know, he knew how to divide us. He knew this would come in. He's playing us all the time. I was never so sure that it's correct. I never thought, again, I'm not a Putin expert. I'm not an expert on anything, apparently. But um, I never believed him to be the great strategist that people make him out to be. I think he's a fantastic tactician. Mm -hmm. And from the point that he is operating from and the role that Russia is playing, some things for him are pretty easy. He is a destructive force. He, Russia is a spoiler state. The idea is just to mess with things and to you know get in between things and to muddle things. That's much easier than creating things, um, you know, creating new processes, new fora, and so on and so forth, and get people to agree on something rather than to get them to disagree on something. So he had it easy in that sense. And also now he has it easy. And I'm saying this with big quotation marks because he has escalation dominance. He's just willing to inflict more damage and more destruction. Um, then, for instance, we are and we should be because we should not be. And we, for instance, I mean, you know, NATO, there's talk being kicked around of a no fly zone. I think it's a terrible idea. We should not be doing this because it means clearly people should be aware of this NATO in, uh, you know, at war with Russia. And that would be, would be war between a nuclear armed alliance and a, the greatest nuclear power on the planet. Things could go sideways really quickly in terrible ways. We should not be escalating further. And so 
the problem on our end is that we are in a, in a way doomed to keep watching what is happening in Ukraine, helping the Ukrainians in an indirect sense as much as we can. But you know, if Putin wants to escalate, again, easy for him because you know he is in the state that he is in, he can escalate. And I, and I, I probably leave it at that because you know anything that would go above and beyond that is trying to you know psychoanalyze putin trying to look into his head i can't do that i think nobody can um i will say that i was not surprised that the invasion took place i kind of i and so and so i wouldn't say that any of this is insane like he's not crazy like he, but some people say now he's batshit crazy he's not batshit crazy uh he's just um very obsessive and you know quite nationalistic with regard to the way that he looks at ukraine and what role it uh, plays on the on the map of europe and he is now adamant um to you know reach this goal and i think a couple of things that come on top and that are not psychoanalyzing necessarily are that this guy has been a dictator for 20 years you know eventually that does something to you i think and he's been in isolation for two years due to being uh, you know uh you know, quite germophobic with regard to to COVID. And so I've read pieces of people who, you know, have been Russia watchers for, for decades, and they say Putin, you know, used to have like a 360 degree view on things. And he's now at about 80 degree, uh, degrees, maybe his view has narrowed immensely. He's only seeing these these goals that he has set out for himself. And he's now and that is on top, I think, frustrated because he expected this to go down in two to three days and then Kiev to fall and everything be like basically be the way it used to be, because, you know, he took the Crimean Peninsula and nothing really happened. And he expected the same to happen again, like the West being kind of outraged, but in the end, you know, and then maybe have a resolution in the General Assembly and 100 states saying, mm, we didn't like that, you know, but, you know, 90 or so going like, eh, and then we keep buying his gas. This time, big miscalculation. This is not what happened, which takes us back to question number one. I think the Ukrainian information um, operation fomented this reaction of the West. We've got we got a bunch of questions coming in in the chat and lots of things you know going on in the direction of of you know this kind of information war and Putin's miscalculation what's coming next you know potential for escalation I want to get to a number of those um, one that I think kind of follows up on the last point that you're making and I'd love to I'd love to you know get your thought on it uh, so Gerhard asks. Um, in your opinion, did Russia not put down the Ukrainian Internet because they didn't want to do it or because they weren't able to do it. I'd say 51% more likely that they did not want to do it. Uh, because as I say, the, this is not a war to Putin and it's not called a war in Russia. You're not even allowed to call it a war anymore. You will go to prison if you do. It is, you know, um, special operations and peace by Tolstoy, you know, mm. uh, it, it's not, it, uh, it's called a special operation. Um, he conceived this as a special operation um, that is quick, um, that is going in two to three days, taking all the strategic uh, assets and then toppling the regime and taking Ukraine. This is also, you can see it in the way that the military operation that the campaign is actually working. They, they're, they're not um, using the big battalion formations that you would expect for a full-fledged invasion of a country as the size of Ukraine, but they're conducting this basically like fast special operations with paratroopers, um, with not enough cover and all, all these kinds of things. And so <clears throat> I think on the outset, this was the idea, take the country, take it really quickly, leave all the infrastructure in place, not to aggravate the civilian population even more, you know, people don't like it if you take away their internet and their energy, uh, but rather just, you know, replace the regime, keep your uh, influence, uh, you know, assured in there from then on. And then that's that like quick, easy boom. And that's, I think, why none of these things that you could expect and that I think the Russians would be able to do did not uh, take place. As I said, 51% is, that's my guess, could be 49%. They maybe tried and it didn't work out. 
it's hard to say at this point. We're yeah, nine so many, days into this. <laughs> there's so many things that are baffling about this, you know, about the political assumptions that went into this war. I mean, it, it, you know, to me, it seems confusing, almost as if, you know, he started to believe Russian state media, you know, their story about Ukraine. So there's so many things I, I just cannot understand yeah. about what they were assuming coming in. Yeah, maybe he drank a bit too much of his own Kool-Aid, in fact, over the last couple of months and years. I wanted to shift over. Um, you, you, you mentioned this um, uh, at one point, and we have a question that, that came up that ties to this. And that's really this question, okay, now that we're in this information war, and in some way, all of us are both uh, you know, participants in some way, potentially, uh, not just observers, what's what's our responsibility in terms of what we should do or what we shouldn't do? And, and, and I'm connecting this to a question that Andreas had asked in the chat. He said, news just came out in Russia, their penalties up to 15 years for spreading fake news. How can you inform people in Russia without making them liable for prosecution? What is it we should and should not be doing as, as both observers and participants in this, in this information war? Look, if, if you're a hacker, um don't hack things um there's literally talk um on the, in the in the cyber domain um talk about people okay let's organize let's do things let's just you know attack russian infrastructure don't do that it's i think it's a bad idea i mean you're breaking all kinds of laws that's one thing uh but you're also you might end up on 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 a list um you know on from some uh, uh russian fsb or something i think it's a bad idea you should not you know in a knee-jerk reaction do anything like this if you're this kind of person that's number one number two if you're not a hacker but just an observer and maybe you were on twitter or linkedin or whatever it is that the kids are using these days um be aware of your information diet um i i'm telling this myself I I need to log off. I think I I have I, I need like at least half a day. I think um, over the weekend where I'm not consuming any of this because <clears throat> I literally I, I did an interview where there was a, a clip running immediately before the interview with with images, and I kind of I almost teared up and I was like mm, you shouldn't be crying on national television, but it 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 it, it kind of I I realized it's starting to get to me. So that's that's a thing. So. Watch what you're, watch what you're, you know, taking in, and two, that's a, a thing that I said at the very beginning. Don't share things, especially don't share imagery of prisoners of war. That's actually not allowed under the Geneva Convention. It is parading prisoners of war for political purposes. So you might think it, I don't know, interesting, sad, hilarious, whatever, that this poor Russian fella uh, is now being fed by the Ukrainians, drinking tea, you know, speaking uh, on FaceTime with his mom, saying, mom, I had no idea what's happening. I mean, that is obviously, I mean, it gets to you. It's interesting. Probably we all have seen this. Don't retweet it. Just, you know, don't. Third, um, what we can do, I said a lot about what we shouldn't be doing, what we can do is, um, you know, all the things that we're already, you know, gearing up to do, like, um, obviously, you're not in a place to uh, give stingers to the, to the Ukrainians, but, you know, you can um, give money uh, or, um, you know, take up, uh, if you have a spare room, take up uh, a family or a Ukrainian, someone, a refugee, and this is coming. I mean, it is to be or probably already the biggest mass migration after World War II. Um, this is bigger. This is bound to get bigger than Syria. And we will feel this every one of us in the, in the next couple of, of months. Remember that we're all that we're only in the beginning stages of this. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to get, you know, uh, a little bit later onto the question of what do you think is coming next? And we have some questions coming up in the chat about, you know, implications for China and Taiwan and how other countries are responding to this. Um, before we before we make that turn, I wanted to ask a little more in depth on this on this kind of information war side and what you were just saying about, you know, be careful what you're consuming. What are we not seeing on Twitter? What are we not seeing if we're following all of this, you know, the kind of the, the popular imagery come up? How, how, how is our view of this conflict being distorted right now? <clears throat> I mean, what you see on Twitter depends on what you do on Twitter. Uh, but it is, I see in, in, in the space that I exist in, I see mainly Ukrainian, um, you know, triumphs. And I see abandoned 
Russian multi-million ruble super expensive high-tech systems that have their tires blown out due to poor maintenance apparently or because they bought Belarusian or Chinese uh, you know you know tires rather than than the good ones I see um, destroyed uh, military equipment um, APCs tanks blown up uh, and so on and so forth I see these things it's a very one-sided picture that I'm getting and one thing I would say is, I mean, it starts with these things, like all these blown up tanks that you're seeing, probably that crew died. I mean, it's unlikely that you can get out of one of those things uh, when it when it's being hit by a, by an RPG. And so you're seeing dead people. Uh, that's number one. And it's Russian soldiers, but it's dead humans, number one. And um, if you dig, you can see the other side as well. I mean, the Ukrainians have losses. Um, their armor gets uh, blown up and um, they're being taken prisoners and that exists it is clearly not uh, you know seeable um, at first glance and it's also interesting to me that's the thing you know i'm saying you know be careful don't retweet you flip on the like national television news like ARD or ZDF in the evening they will show all these things that i don't retweet um, you know not necessarily like the ones that show dead bodies and, and carnage that also exists but they will show those things and then they will say you know in, in the voiceover well we couldn't verify if this is actually if this material but it's you know it's being handed and i'm like mm, maybe it's not the best idea then if you're unable to verify these things to just keep showing these these images and these videos that are uh, you know coming out of there um i kind of lost my train of thought <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think i think we've, we've got we've got a loop back there actually through through a comment here robert um asked something that might that might stitch this this uh, some of these 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 comments back together um so robert's saying regarding the information war what in your opinion is the role of osint and i'm assuming he's talking about open source intelligence community yeah. what's the role of the osint community in this war which gives the world a very transparent view on what's happening in ukraine you're it's talking about yeah, it's hugely important. I mentioned this uh, during my remarks. I mean, um, there's one uh, one example. Actually, that's trivial. Like anybody could see this, um, where the Russian National Security Council had this supposed live meeting in the in the Kremlin, which was supposed to be you know five o'clock Moscow time. As I said, you know, live on television, and this was this legendary meeting where people were basically were kind of the idea. I think politically speaking, was Putin was taking this elite circle around him he was taking them captive because all of them you know pledged their allegiance to the cause and so you know there was no way for any of them Lavrov and all these folks to ever walk back from this they were on supposedly live national television saying to Russia uh, to Putin I'm with you turns out this wasn't live because some of them were wearing wristwatches and it was actually like 12 15 or something so this was clearly taped and that was immediately recognized by the OSINT, you know, experts who will be looking at things. They do much more interesting things, of course. Um, like, for instance, this one thing was the supposed attack on a chlorine gas tank that I was mentioning, one of those false flag operations. It took hours and then they found the original video that this was, you know, um, manufactured with, which is, you know, someplace on YouTube with zero views. And you could, for instance, a, a way to simply verify that this is, in fact, exactly that video, which was like five years old, rather than, you know, this uh, supposed Ukrainian attack on this chlorine gas tank two days ago, is that you had the, uh, the audio track from the video that the Russians disseminated and the old video on YouTube, and they're identical. You throw them into Audacity and you see, whoop, it's exactly the same thing. And interestingly, the Russian video cuts off exactly where one of the people in the video starts talking. And so these are very simple things that people online are now actually, uh, you know, quite apt at and quite, you know, uh, fast. But OSINT goes way above all the uh, above and beyond all these things. If you look at, for instance, what uh, Planet or Maxar and all these commercial satellite uh, companies are now providing in terms of imagery, and that is, uh, you know, electro optical and also uh, synthetic aperture radar you can do the most interesting things you can do things now if you've got some cash lying around with this kinds of data that you can buy that i'm um, i'd say like 10 15 years ago only like cii cia um, ia nsa could do uh, maybe that's 
maybe that's a bit of but that's hyperbole let's make it 25 years or 20 years and then we're right we're in the ballpark and so all these things are taking place uh, as well so people are looking at the column that is now you know kind of stuck before kiev and they're looking at what is moving where and um and i think it plays a tremendous role a big role i think it's one it's it's the war where this has the biggest impact uh, up till now and um, this will only continue. So we will, I think, see a whole new culture, hopefully, I hope for this, uh, a culture emerge uh, of uh, dealing intelligently with all this open source information that is out there and you know, create actual verifiable knowledge um, by you know, seeking the ground truth and looking, what, what am I seeing? This is supposed you know, to be this village now? Well, according to the weather report, there's it's snowing there right now and so it can't be what people tell me it is and you know just be become you know apt at doing this on a regular basis just as observers and then having people around everywhere doing this basically in a, in a more professional sense to fact check what we're seeing it seems it seems like a wonderful curative to a lot of the last years of just sort of confusion about what the truth is that, that now there's this there's so much pressure and intensity on bringing these things out to light yeah um the, the question I'd want, you know, we're, we're, we've got we've got about, you know, uh, 18 minutes left here in the talk, I, I wanted to kind of point you towards the future and 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 ask your opinion on what, what's your expectation for how Russia is going to is going to adapt in this situation? How are they going to adapt now that they've had all these massive, massive failures and setbacks? What do you expect to be coming next? What are kind of the some of the, the scenarios that you're expecting? Um, I've got three scenarios like a a worst case and a best case and something in the middle. I think the worst case is that Ukraine is not the end of it, uh, either because uh, Putin's ambition is larger than that or because something just goes terribly wrong. I mean, we're now delivering weapons to Ukraine on almost a daily basis, and it's super important to keep like tight operational security around these things. But, you know, still some convoy might get hit um, or, you know, some targets uh, on, on uh, within Polish borders you know, might be might be hit, you know, and then we're at a point where we might live in an Article 5 situation and, you know, some NATO situation where, for instance, Poland could, you know, call upon the alliance to join, you know, in, in a retribution um, um, sense. And that would obviously be terrible and a very, very dangerous military escalation. And I'm I'm, I'm not going to talk about the nuclear component of this because I think people are, you know, already with the with the nuclear power plants this morning. And so people, it seems to me that people already are a bit panicky about this. We don't need to be talking about this, I think. Well, well I, I think that's actually reason why we should be talking about this. OK, because uh, from 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 my side. Yeah, I get some thumbs up from the audience here. Uh, Johannes is, is in agreement on that. Um, really from your view what 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 are the risks here what how would you say you know we should have a more realistic view on what's on what's happening or or how would you kind of bring the panic level down if we should so i i had a i, I did a podcast um yesterday and i had like a four minute answer and then apparently on the uh, on the air they took like out of context like only one thing that i said it, within these four minutes and so i get people hitting me up saying you think it's a great idea to tell people that you know russian nuclear weapons can reach berlin within seven minutes you know now and i'm like yeah that's like one thing i said and then i said that we should not be panicking and so the main message really is we should not be panicking a nuclear war can happen actually that is the case since the 40s <laughs> we've we were living in the nuclear age we still do people tend to forget but it's it's a fact we can uh, at any minute cease to exist as a species on this planet because we've got weapons lying around that you know can devastate everything in minutes okay i do not lose sleep over any of this right now um because what is actually going on is what happened on sunday is that putin raised the you know alert level of his deterrence force and the nuclear component is part of that um that's what we're piecing together as experts online and i'm mainly you know looking at what my russian colleagues are you know gleaning from all of this that means that we're now apparently on uh, in russia 
on stage two of four in terms of readiness with regard to the nuclear forces. That doesn't mean a lot. Um, some nuclear subs left their harbors, um, some personnel numbers increased, some road mo mobile ICBMs you know, you know, dispersed in the woods. It might even be that there's no connection between the two because this is trained all the time. And there's really no reason to you know, flip out over any of this. Biden did the right thing. They did not mirror this. They just keep an eye on it. And they, they, they did nothing with regard to their you know, DEF CON level. Similarly, NATO is calm about this, and we should be calm about this. Um, this is a political signal, okay? What Putin did is he kind of addressed the West with this and pointed at his nuclear weapons and said, I see all your sanctions and all your weapons deliveries to Ukraine. Please don't forget that I have these things just in case. And, you know, the best thing we can do is say, message received. And we're not going to escalate this any further. And so there's, as of now, no reason to be, you know, uh, you know, to expect nuclear war breaking out anytime soon. Um, if that answers the question, maybe we could go to the, the better scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me some better scenarios. Uh, let's go to the, to the not so great, but not terrible scenario, which is kind of in the middle which is kind of a Cold War-ish situation in the years to come. Cold War is not great. Um, and it's probably also, it would be wrong to expect this to be like, uh, like history reloaded. This will be different because, I mean, we've still got all the challenges of the 21st century going on. We still have climate change. We still have, you know, technology. We still have, you know, all these other, you know, pandemics, all these things going on. So security, um has a different you know meaning in 2022 than it had in say 1962 so if there is such a thing as a cold war it will be different in many ways the similarity will be that the west will be in a position and nato will be in a position where they are doing where they are increasing their efforts to deter and you know contain putin with regard to any further aggression that might occur and that is one of the reasons why, of course, we're now we've apparently have decided in Germany to spend much more money on defense. But what will you know go hand in hand with this is seeking um, aggressively diplomatic solutions, seeking um, as soon as it's possible uh, arms control solutions to decrease risks and tension and try to dig us out of that hole that we're in and probably will be in for a couple of years or maybe even decades. So it is important to me that even in this case, which is not the worst case, it is a paradigm shift. We will be living in a different, we are living in a different world now since February 24. Here's the best case. The best case is Putin's system implodes, okay? The best case is we flip on our televisions uh, in three days or so and Putin is gone, okay? He has gone swimming in the Moskva and never returned. And there's some new dude, um even like russia experts um have no clue who that could be it is actually he is that you know single a unit um in his autocratic uh, power uh, structure but it could be that the frustration and apparently the shock and the surprise that had hit, that has hit the russian elites uh apparently these sanctions were not expected there and they were not um you know prized in as they say um and so that could be the best case that simply Putin goes away and there is, you know, there is a cause to stop that war. And then, you know, you can try to roll all of this back and then see where we stand with Russia after that happens. No idea how likely that is, but I think it is, um, it is a possibility. And, um, if that is if that is um if that's not happening then of course you know this the idea of the sanctions is of course to tell putin if you stop the war we can take away the sanctions again maybe he's coming to his senses that's also uh, you know some second version of the best case link linking your your best case scenario with what we were talking about the information war and the role of the public do you see that there's any any possibility or any role that the russian people themselves might play a a, a role in, uh, in 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 a in a in a change of government or in uh, bringing putin down 
you know, I mean, it's easy for me to say, like, I'm sitting here at my desk, you know, um, I'm good. Um, if you're Russian and you're going out on the street and you're demonstrating and you're holding up a sign, you know, Putin stopped the war. I think I, I'm seeing this out of the corner of my eye, but I think right now, like today, Russia has, um, you know, is in the process of changing a couple of laws. I think you can go to prison for like up to five years. So again, you know, easy for me to say to go, you know, rise up, Russian people, bring down this terrible dictator of yours. I don't know. I mean, this is, it all makes sense now. Navalny, for instance, there's a reason he wanted this guy gone before any of this takes place. Navalny would probably be in a position to call upon people and they would come out for him and he would be like a leading figure for people to rally around and to you know ferment the opposition right now there's no one there navalny is in the prison is in prison and his uh you know all his system of supporters is under constant pressure by by the russian state and so <clears throat> I, I i'd wish for it you know it would be awesome if the russians were able to just you know revolutionize this thing but uh, again i shy away from you know calling for it or anything like that it's a terrible situation in russia yeah, it, it does seem it does seem you know almost as if uh, you know if we if we can if we can match all of the 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 tactical and strategic you know miscalculation and 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 terrible thinking that went into the invasion putin does in some ways seem to have been pretty masterful still in managing the, yeah. the the actual Russian sphere and in the information sphere domestically to to undermine those opportunities for for popular resistance or for 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 challenges to his rule. Yeah, not as good as China, <laughs> and so that will be something that we'll be probably talking soon uh, uh, soon about um, even more. But yeah, uh, pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean the last the last uh, radio station went offline, and then Rain TV went offline a couple of days ago. So all the last independent media outlets are pretty much you know you know being shut down at the moment. And so I actually I have a couple of uh, you know a friend recently said before Russia Today also went offline online in Europe. He said he watched some Russia Today, and he said it's so fascinating. It would you know you know be it would make great research if things weren't so terrible, but because it is truly a different reality. I, I, you, you just mentioned uh, China in there, and, and uh, one of our fellows, uh, Yadong, just uh, he'd asked a question earlier. He said, do you think Russia invading Ukraine sets an example for China to invade Taiwan in the future? And so I, I think probably one of the one of the questions we've come we've come up in a couple ways in the chat is, what's the influence or what's the perception you know outside of the west outside of russia when we look at china or india what 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 do you think is the influence of, of what's happening now um i think china is watching closely what is going on i mean they're kind of on the fence uh, in this it's interesting that in the security council they abstained uh, rather than vetoing uh, the resolution along with the russians so i think there is some they're seeking some distance to Putin. It's not that they're, you know, uh, closing rank closely uh, with Russia at the moment. But I think it's, you know, China has every interest to, for instance, undercut sanctions uh, and to, for instance, with regard to aviation and also military equipment to just, you know, step in where the West is withdrawing and just, you know, um, establish even stronger uh, trade relations and ties with Russia um, in, in that regard. And that is something that we should be looking very closely at in the next couple of years, because this uh, cooperation in the tech sector between China and Russia already was an interesting thing developing over the last couple of years. And with regard to Taiwan, I mean, it's it's weird. Like Putin has this thing, he always invades countries like after the Olympics. <laughs> and um, and <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> seems like seems like there's a good article in that already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a thing to him. I don't know. Um, and and she, uh, she also, I think there's a big there's this um, uh, China the 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 Communist Party um, the um, anniversary is coming up, and there's Chinese experts tell me that it is very likely that Xi Jinping wants Taiwan to be united with 
uh, with China wants this anniversary is actually right around the corner. He wants this done before this. And, you know, with Putin now actually invading and actually invading at that point in time, like again, after the Olympics. And um, so it's kind of I'm at a I'm at a stage now where I think maybe we should just believe these folks and actually think that what they're telling us they will do, they will do. And so I worry about Taiwan a lot, especially since we're super distracted now, obviously, in Europe and, uh, you know, on the US side with regard to what's going on in Europe. And um so it could set a precedent, what I'm saying. Um, it could set a precedent for China moving on Taiwan. Is and it, then it, obviously we would, be, we would be, again, in a whole different you know, scenario that opens a whole new you know, can of worms. It's, it's a really interesting you know, uh, idea that you just opened there up at the end. I mean, you know, through the Cold War, I think after, we always thought about these communications from, from leaders as, as like some sort of signaling uh, you know, to their own population or signaling to other elites. And, and you know, maybe when we look at, at leaders like Xi and we look at leaders like Putin, maybe they are actually telling the truth you know, using this global media to just broadcast their intentions and prepare everyone. This is what we're going to do. Get ready. Yeah, might be. Or I think I think that is the way that is probably a better basis to operate on because it is kind of the hope for the best, prepare for the worst kind of way to deal with this. And so you're probably not, you know, caught uh, as off guard as we some of us, I think, were now with regard to what's happening in Ukraine. So, so Frank, as we're as we're in the closing minutes here, um, I just wanted to ask you what would be what would be your number one takeaway that you'd want our audience to come away from the talk from this morning? Oof. I think you know this is I I suppose mostly a German audience. There's this this word that's you know, being kicked around now and that uh, Bundeskanzler Olaf Scholz used during his address in the Bundestag on Sunday, uh, Zeitenwende. And I think it's easily said, and it is true, we are living in a paradigm shift that is probably uh, the biggest after the end of the Second World War or up to par with German reunification and the end of the, the Cold War. And it's um, hard for people, experts well, like me, who work on like me, who work on like me, who work on like myself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard uh, even for people like me who do this on a daily basis. Like this is my day job, basically, to wrap my head around all the implications of this. And so I am su super empathetic, and uh, I totally feel people who say. A hundred billion for defense? What about you know all our schools? What about you know, the hospitals, the pandemic, the energy transition, and so on and so forth? We need money for all of these kinds of things. And that is, of course, also true. And so um, the biggest takeaway that I think people uh, should keep in mind over the next, in fact, weeks and months is that we have a big national conversation ahead of us in terms of how do we actually implement this almost 180 degree turn with regard to how we deal with um, the rest of Europe and the world. And uh, I can only call on people to, you know, not fall back into these old patterns of knee jerk reactions and view all of these things through the lenses that we've used for the last 30 years or so. We need some fresh thinking and everybody to be able to maybe make some concessions here and there. Um, and that will be a, a tough thing to go through and a, a, a tough discussion to have. And it's just, I think, important for people to now mentally prepare themselves for this. This is truly an interesting time to live in, but it will also you know, be uh, quite stressful for, for everyone involved. Frank, thank you so much for your views here. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Uh, the, the, we had last two comments in the chat uh, uh, when I'd asked the question of what should be the takeaway. Both Andreas and Karina said, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, of course, is also true. <laughs>
But Frank, I really appreciate how you've been able to bring your expertise to kind of elevate the discussion here. For everyone who's joined us, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I'm so sorry we didn't have a chance to answer all the questions. Uh, for those of you who'd like to continue the discussion, I put the link to our Ada networking group in the chat. We'd love for you to join there. We'd love for you to continue the conversation there. Um, ask questions there. Come on to the group. Uh, share your thoughts. We'd love to have further discussions. Um, and, and again, thank you for everyone for joining. Frank, you're getting thanks from everyone. Great, insightful views. Fantastic expert meeting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We genuinely appreciate you. For anyone who wants to follow Frank, again, uh, as he'd mentioned, he has a very highly, uh, a very popular podcast called Sika Heights Haba, uh, where him, together with three of his colleagues, regularly discusses current developments in German security and defense policy, as well as Europe and the world. Uh, you can also follow him on Twitter, uh, Dr. Frank Sauer. Thank you, Frank, so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you and be safe. Bye.